Uh, and so I put the link to this uh, tutorial notebook uh, on the Slack channel. So hopefully everybody has access to that link. And what I'll encourage folks to do while I'm going through this uh, is to have two things open uh, on one side of your screen. Um, uh, have a browser window open with this uh, Colab notebook. And on the other side of the screen, have, um, uh, have the stream going so you can follow along with what I'm doing. Um, so basically, this final uh, session of the tutorial uh, is going to be on applying Gaussian process uh, models to a, a certain task within the domain of atomistic simulation. And in particular, what we're going to be looking at is building force fields for molecular dynamic simulations. And we'll be using a code um, that we've been building uh, at Harvard called FLARE, which stands for uh, Fast Learning of Atomistic Rare Events. Um, basically, this, this notebook will, will kind of walk you through uh, some of the steps involved in, in using this code to build, uh, build force fields and, and perform uh, MD simulations. So um, just to mention, uh, this has sort of been an ongoing effort in, uh, in the Materials Intelligence Research Group at Harvard. Um, this group is led by Professor Boris Kaczynski uh, and a number of folks um, within the group and, and also a few outside of the group have contributed to the project. Uh, over the last couple of years. And so uh, to start with, I'm going to have everyone run this first block of code. What this is going to do is take care of all of the uh, installation of packages that you'll need uh, throughout the tutorial. So if you hit shift enter on this block of code, it's going to, to start installing a bunch of packages. And this will take about five minutes. So uh, definitely start it now uh, while I go over some, some introductory uh, material. So, okay, um, for folks that are not familiar with molecular dynamics, uh, I thought I'd start with just a very general introduction to uh, what molecular dynamics is uh, and, and what we try to do in these types of simulations. So really the idea behind MD is extremely simple but also, you know, very powerful. What we want to do is, is take a material of interest and sort of zoom you know, all the way in uh, to, the, to the atomistic scale and look at how individual atoms inside the material are interacting with each other and, and moving around in time. And the way one of these simulations works is you basically uh, repeat uh, the, these four steps on the right here. So the first step is to initialize your system. So you define basically a, a set of atoms inside of a box, which is usually periodic. And then you, you repeat steps two and three here. So you have some energy model, which is telling you for the current configuration of atoms in the system, uh, what is the potential energy associated with that configuration of atoms. And you can take the gradient of that function to get the forces on each ion. And these forces allow you to integrate the equations of motion, which for us is just you know, Newton's second law. Uh, and so we can update the positions of the ions. And then we just repeat step two and three uh, over and over again, compute the forces, use those forces to update the positions of the ions, and this allows you to simulate uh, the dynamics of the material. Now, the, the sort of key step here uh, is, is step two, cal calculating the forces. So if you really want to scale these simulations up to uh, you know, really challenging materials involving uh, you know, many thousands or, or even millions of atoms, it's essential that these forces are computed uh, you know, both, both cheaply uh, in order for it to be possible to do sort of large-scale simulations, and also ideally these forces should be accurate. And what I mean by accurate is we want to get as close as possible to, to the ground truth, which, uh, you know, if it were possible would be calculating basically the ground state energy uh, of, you know, the many electron Schrodinger equation. Now in practice, it's not possible to get that exact ground state energy, and so we have to use methods like density functional theory, uh, which, uh, which are approximate, uh, but that, that's kind of the reference that we, we want to get as close as possible to. And so the challenge is building an energy model uh, that can get you sort of quantum level accuracy while, while still being uh, cheap enough to enable big simulations. And this is sort of where machine learning in the last decade has, has sort of entered the field. Um, it, it's been used as a very powerful method for taking quantum mechanical reference data and using it to parameterize much faster models um, uh, that, that are extremely flexible and can sort of get you at that level of accuracy uh, uh, that, that you need in order to simulate interesting, you know, reactive systems. So th this is sort of the domain that we're going to be talking about uh, uh, for this part of the tutorial. 
And specifically, um, the code that we'll be using, which is called uh, Flare, has this, this kind of goal in mind. So basically, what we want to do is automate the process of learning one of these force fields uh, for, for large-scale molecular dynamic simulations. And the way that we, we automate the process is using active learning with, with Gaussian process regression. So everything that you've uh, heard about in the, in the previous sessions, uh, the uncertainties of the GP in, in particular, uh, are going to enable this, uh, this sort of closed-loop uh, learning procedure. And this diagram here is sort of showing you uh, what, what we're going after. So uh, at the beginning of one of these on-the-fly simulations, we, we have you know, basically an empty data set, and we make an initial call to some quantum mechanical reference. Uh, so usually this is density functional theory, but in principle it could also be some, some quantum chemical method. Uh, and you calculate the, the forces on, on initial structure of atoms. Uh, you train an initial model. And because we're training a Gaussian process, we can evaluate uncertainties on all of the atoms. And so we, we take a look at the uncertainties, and if they are unacceptably high, we stay in this right loop. Where we make calls to DFT, and we update the, the training set as needed. Uh, but when the uncertainties drop below you know, a threshold value, uh, we can accept the predictions of the Gaussian process and use uh, the Gaussian process forces to update the system. And this is, in general, much, much faster than evaluating forces with, for example, density functional theory. And so you can perform this loop in a totally kind of automated fashion. The, the idea is the Gaussian process is taking care of all of the decision making about what to include in the training set and, and what to sort of pass over. Uh, and this, this allows you uh, uh, to sort of step back and, and not need to kind of manually construct these data sets by hand, which is often how uh, uh, this is done uh, in the literature. And once the, the training process is, uh, is complete, uh, so once you have kind of converged the model and you're not making any, any new calls to DFT, the idea is you can take the final model and uh, implement it in a, a sort of large-scale MD software like LAMPS and perform bigger simulations. So in this particular example, I'm showing you a simulation that we've done in our group of uh, a fast ion conductor called silver iodide, which involved you know, about 10,000 atoms and uh, uh, time scales on the order of uh, a few nanoseconds. So this is going to be uh, the goal. And the last section of this presentation is going to walk you through uh, basically an example of this automated workflow. Um, and so before we proceed, let's make sure that the installation uh, completed. So if we go up, and if you see the, the play button here, uh, the code is no longer running. That means that uh, everything is installed. And if we go to the import section here, you should be able to run this block of code. And if everything runs, uh, then everything installed properly on, on Google Colab. And basically, all of the code below is going to, is going to run just fine. Um, and b before I dive into the content of the tutorial, I'll just mention um, if you have questions while we're going through this, uh, definitely post them to the Slack. And I will occasionally uh, take a look at um, any questions that have been posted and try to answer them. So uh, definitely don't be shy. Uh, ask as many questions uh, as you like. Um, and without further ado, let's, let's kind of dive into the notebook here. So the first task that we're going to look at is training one of, these, one of these force fields on static data. So we're going to be in kind of offline mode. Uh, we already have some, some data set that's lying around, and we want to use uh, the, the forces from that data set to, to create one of these Gaussian process models. So the training data that we're going to use to do this is sort of a classic benchmark data set that's called MD17. Uh, so this was introduced in these, uh, these three papers uh, here. And basically what it is, is a, a set of structures of small organic molecules uh, coming from ab initio molecular dynamics uh, simulations. And um, uh, basically, uh, each of these molecules has um, energies uh, and forces in the data set and also the positions of the ions. And that's basically all of the information that we need to uh, construct one of these Gaussian process force fields. So this block of code here is going to download the data set from the web. Uh, if you just run it, it's, I think, a few hundred megabytes. It should just take a few seconds to download. And what we're going to do is uh, just define a few NumPy arrays containing the, the data. So uh, we will define our species. So we're going to focus in particular on the aspirin molecule in this data set. 
And in the aspirin molecule, you have three species, uh, basically uh, carbon atoms, uh, oxygen atoms, and hydrogen atoms. Um, and we'll define some NumPy arrays, uh, giving us the forces from the data set, the positions of all of the ions. Uh, we're going to define a, a big cell that the, the molecule is going to live inside of, um, and that will define our data. And this next block is going to let you visualize what one of these structures looks like. Uh, so if you run it, you should see uh, basically a giant aspirin molecule. This is just a frame that we kind of arbitrarily picked from the data set. And uh, th this is kind of what we're dealing with. So you can see we have uh, these gray atoms here are, are carbons, uh, the red atoms are oxygens, and the, the little white atoms here are uh, hydrogen atoms. And if you were to sort of step through this data set frame by frame, you would see this aspirin molecule sort of dynamically moving around. Um, and there are you know, a few hundred thousand uh, configurations. Uh, and so we, uh, we get to see a bunch of different configurations um, uh, of this aspirin molecule. And for each configuration, we have forces uh, on each of the ions. And that's going to be the input data that we use to train uh, our Gaussian process model. So before we actually get into defining the model, uh, let's first choose a training and a validation set. Um, so the training set is going to be fairly small relative to the, the types of models that, that get trained in the literature. This is just to, to sort of uh, keep everything uh, contained uh, to something you can run on, on Google Colab. But, uh, you know, in general, you want to push this to, you know, at least a few thousand uh, training structures. Uh, but here we'll, we'll do a training set of 100 uh, uh, of, these, uh, of these structures. And we're going to validate on a, on a small set of uh, 20 structures. And these are just randomly drawn from the data set. So, like I said, there, there are a few hundred thousand configurations, and we're just going to, uh, to pick them out of a hat. And now um, we can get into uh, the actual training procedure. Uh, so I'm going to step you through basically what's involved in training one of these, these sparse Gaussian process force fields. And uh, notice I'm calling this a sparse GP. Um, this isn't something that we touched on uh, in a lot of detail in the previous sessions. Uh, but basically, this is a way to accelerate a Gaussian process model. So instead of sort of storing a very large covariance matrix uh, containing kernels between every single training uh, label, uh, what we do is we sparsify. So we try to grab a representative uh, set of atomic environments that sort of covers the entire data set. Uh, and this dramatically sort of simplifies the, the evaluation of the Gaussian process. Uh, basically, we're projecting the entire data set onto this, this smaller sparse set, uh, and it allows you to, to basically get a model that's much, much faster than a full GP, uh, which would require you to do a loop over every single training example. Uh, so we'll be using sparse GPs, and the force field that we're going to train is a many-body force field. So we, we want to capture sort of non-trivial many-body effects and correlations uh, that are happening in the environment of each atom. And I'm, I'm going to describe for you a little bit of uh, the theory that's involved in, in building one of these many-body force fields. Uh, and so a lot of what I'm about to present um, is based on uh, uh, some, some work that's been done by uh, folks who developed the Gaussian approximation potential, if, if you're familiar with it. Um, this, this was sort of pioneered in 2010 uh, by Gabor Chani. Uh, and there's a very good tutorial introduction to this technique uh, that was uh, written in 2015. Uh, but basically, they, they were the first ones to sort of apply sparse Gaussian process regression to the task of learning uh, forces for molecular dynamics. Uh, and the input to our model, uh, we are drawing from uh, what's called the atomic cluster expansion, uh, which is a, a sort of formalism that was recently uh, put forward by Ralph Droughts. Uh, you can read about it here in this, in this PRB. Um, and so let's, let's dive into some of the theory. And so just to give you a little bit of um, background on the landscape. Uh, so in the last 10 years or so, there have been a number of, uh, of different types of machine learning models that, are, that have been put forward for doing this type of uh, molecular and, and materials modeling. And you can think of many of these models as breaking into two, two broad classes. So uh, in the first class, we have uh, linear models. And so here, what we're doing is we're assigning a local energy to each atom in the system. And this local energy is expressed as a, a simple dot product of a descriptor vector, which is describing what's going on in the, in the environment of each atom, and a vector of training coefficients beta. And you compute this dot product for each atom, uh, and that allows you to assign a local energy 
you sum over all of the atoms in your system to get the total energy. And then from the gradient of that total energy, you can calculate the forces. Uh, and so models like moment tensor potentials and uh, spectral neighbor analysis potentials fall under this class of, of linear models. Um, the second broad class uh, uh, is kernel-based approaches. And this is what we're going to focus on in this tutorial. So here, the local energy is expressed not as a simple dot product, but as a sum over kernels. As we've seen in the, in the previous uh, presentations, this is exactly what a Gaussian process looks like. Uh, so when we evaluate a local energy here, what we do is we sum over the, uh, the training points, calculate the kernel between each training point and the, the test point, di, and then we dot this vector of kernels into uh, our, our uh, vector of training coefficients alpha, and this is how we evaluate local energies with, with a kernel-based model. And notice um, uh, that you know, the, the cost of this evaluation is going to grow with the size of the training set, or in our, our case, because we're dealing with the sparse Gaussian process, with the size of the sparse set. So this is you know, one of the Achilles heels of Gaussian process-based uh, or kernel-based models, is that the complexity, the computational complexity, is you know, linear in the size of the training set, uh, but at the same time, one of the beautiful things about kernel-based approaches is that you can get rigorous uncertainties out of the model. And this is, this is by virtue of the kernel function. So uh, we basically have a well-defined way to make direct comparisons between the test point and all of the training points. And this allows us to, to get you know, me meaningful and well-calibrated uncertainties out of the model. So you can see in this plot on the right here, this is a recent benchmark of a few different models that have been proposed in the last few years. And you can see uh, linear models like moment tensor potentials in blue uh, tend to be the, the cheapest in terms of computational cost. Uh, the Gaussian process-based gap model uh, in purple here is slower, uh, but, but importantly, it's just as accurate. And uh, you know, the key thing for us in doing sort of closed loop automated learning is we can get uncertainties out of, uh, out of models uh, like this. So this, this is sort of a broad overview uh, of, the, uh, of the type of model we're going to be building. But what's really important in constructing a model like this is choosing uh, how you describe local environments uh, in your system. So remember, we're dealing with a, a set of atoms. And what we need to do in order to sort of get this model to work is we need to take the local environment of each atom. So here I'm, I'm just sort of showing you a cartoon of, uh, of an aspirin molecule. And we're focusing in on a particular atom inside of this aspirin molecule, um, atom I. And we're drawing a sphere around atom I and looking at all of the atoms that are living inside of that sort of local chemical environment. And the challenge that, uh, uh, that, that we need to address is converting this, this three-dimensional object, this three-dimensional set of atoms, into a vector of descriptors that we can feed into the machine learning model. And it's really important that we respect all the symmetries uh, that we know must be present for this type of model. So what we're doing is we're building an energy model, and we know that if we take this aspirin molecule and rotate it in any way, the energy is going to be completely invariant to, to that rotation. And similar, similarly, if we swap uh, two atoms of the same species, the energy is not going to change. And that's, that's a kind of permutational symmetry. And so when we build our descriptors, we need to satisfy you know, this rotational symmetry and, and permutational symmetry. And we do it in the following way. The idea is we're going to perform a, a loop over each of the atoms in the environment. And we're going to focus in particular on this interatomic distance vector, Rij, which is connecting the central atom I to each of the environment atoms J. And we pass that distance vector through a basis set. And for simplicity, we're just expressing this basis as uh, you know, a product of uh, radial basis functions R um, and spherical harmonics Y. So you can see the, the radial basis set is sort of probing what's happening at uh, each distance uh, in the environment. And the spherical harmonic is probing angular information, so it's, it's a function of angle. And the first step in computing one of these descriptors is just to uh, loop over all of the atoms and calculate this covariant descriptor. So at this point, if you rotate the atoms, uh, this vector is going to rotate as well. Uh, and so the, the key is to transform this into an invariant descriptor. And we do this by basically summing over the n index of the spherical harmonics. So we're, we're kind of exploiting here the sum rule uh, to get a rotationally invariant quantity. And this gives us a, a perfectly good vector that we can use uh, to build a force field for molecular dynamics. 
And so this, this type of idea um, was proposed by Ralph Droughts uh, uh, very recently, and it's kind of a, a beautiful uh, and computationally efficient way uh, to calculate these, these descriptors uh, in a way that satisfies all the symmetries of the problem. And so that defines sort of the, the descriptor that goes into the model. Uh, and so the final thing uh, to mention on the, on the theory side of things is, uh, uh, you know, what do these, these force fields actually look like and how do we evaluate uh, th things like energies and uncertainties. Um, and so like I mentioned earlier, local energies are evaluated by, uh, by computing kernels between the, the test point, uh, uh, DI, and all of the, the training points. And importantly, uh, we can extract uncertainties from, uh, from these estimates. So for, for each quantity of interest, which in these simulations are energies, forces, and stresses, we can get associated uncertainties. Uh, and, and you'll recall from the previous presentations that the uncertainties we get look a little something like this. So uh, basically, you can break it into two components. There's an epistemic uncertainty, which is quantifying you know, how far away is the, the current test point from all of the training points. Uh, and there's also an associated noise uh, uncertainty, uh, which is quantifying uh, basically variation in the reference data um, uh, that your model isn't, isn't able to capture. So for us, uh, you know, our reference data is something like a DFT calculation. There might be uh, basically fluctuations coming from a lack of convergence in, in the k-point grid uh, or something along those lines. Uh, and so uh, just to remind you, on the right here is uh, just a simple 1D Gaussian process for uh, two hydrogen atoms. So what, what is the energy as we separate the, the two atoms? Uh, and you know, this is one of the simplest um, potential energy surfaces you can look at because it's one dimensional, uh, but it gives you a sense for, uh, for what's happening here. So again, the, the key feature of, of these GP models is that when you're on top of a training point, uh, the uncertainties go to a minimum value. And here notice that this is a, a noiseless GP. So uh, I'm just assuming that there isn't any noise uh, on, the, on the observation. But as you move away from the training manifold, the key point is that the uncertainties approach a maximum value. And uh, when we do our on-the-fly learning, we're going to use this property to make judgment calls about when we need to uh, sort of gather more data and refine the force field. And so in full generality, of course, we have a lot of atoms in the system, and it's going to be a much higher dimensional potential energy surface that we're trying to learn. Um, but the, the key idea is, is the same, uh, and, and the uncertainties behave in the same way even in these much higher dimensional spaces. And so that, that's sort of a kind of crash course on uh, you know, Gaussian process-based force fields. Uh, and so now we're going to actually build one of these. Um, and I'll, I'll just pause for a brief moment and see if there's anything in the Slack um, to address. So uh, Ryan notes that there are a couple of errors with the install. So yeah, th there will be some errors reported, uh, but it should still install fine. So basically, if you're able to run the import block, uh, then everything should be working fine. Um, as for connection issues, hopefully uh, people can hear me clearly. Um, uh, William, Everything you... is uh, good there. Um, I, I think that was a local network issue. OK. Uh, in the collab link, I did pin it. Um, so if you scroll up, you should see uh, you should see the link here and be able to to access it. Um, okay, great. So I will proceed with um, uh, with the actual code section. So again, what we're going to try to do is take a static data set and train one of these Gaussian process uh, force fields. So. Uh, what we need to do basically is is make two choices. We need to choose our descriptor. So this is going to take this three-dimensional configuration of atoms as input and give us a vector of uh, rotationally invariant quantities. Um, so Jonathan, there is actually a question about um, why the sum over m makes things rotationally invariant. Yeah, OK, uh, good. So let me go back up to this slide. Yeah, so the property that, that we're sort of exploiting here is um, uh, you might recall it from, from like a quantum mechanics class. Uh, it's the sum rule of spherical harmonics. So if you have a spherical harmonic YLM and you multiply it by itself and you sum over the M index, uh, what you end up with is a value that uh, is rotationally invariant. And that's, that's exactly the property that we're using here. So notice for each L index here, we're performing, we're taking the, the covariant vector C, multiplying it by itself, uh, and performing a sum over M. 
And what that gives us is something that's rotationally invariant. And one thing that, that's nice, and you can read more about it in this, uh, in this great paper by Ralph Droughts, is that you can generalize this idea. So here we're just kind of contracting the covariant vector with itself once, which is going to give us a vector of three body quantities. Um, but in principle, you can do this multiple times. Uh, and what you need to do is sort of include some Klebsch-Gordon coefficients to make sure that you're, you're kind of contracting things appropriately. Um, but, uh, but the, same, the, the sort of idea is the same. Um, uh, and that would give you sort of a higher uh, body order uh, uh, vector of invariant quantities. And in, in principle, you can keep going. So you can do a contraction of uh, four of these covariancy vectors to give you an even higher body order expansion. Um, but here, we're, we're just going to deal with this, uh, this sort of simpler object. And for folks who are familiar with it, this is very similar to the SOAP descriptor, uh, which is used in Gaussian approximation potentials. Um, basically, like the SOAP descriptor, it's an invariant vector of, of three body quantities. Um, so yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a good question. Okay. So uh, now let's let's take a look at, at some of the actual code. So like I mentioned, we have to choose a descriptor, and we also need to choose a, a kernel to define our Gaussian process model. So um, when we build one of these uh, uh, so-called B2 descriptors from from the atomic cluster expansion we have to make uh, a few choices. And you can treat these as uh, hyperparameters of the model. So we, we basically need to choose a, a cutoff function and cutoff radius. So our, our model is, is local, and information outside of our local cutoff sphere isn't going to be included in the model. And we need to, to decide how to smoothly sort of take the descriptor to zero as we approach the, the boundary of the cutoff sphere. Um, we need to choose a radial basis set and also sort of truncate that radial basis set at a certain point. Uh, and we need to choose a, um, basically the number of spherical harmonics that we want to include in the descriptor. Uh, and so in this example, I'm just sort of uh, going to give you good values for the MD17 data set. Um, but if you wanted to build a force field uh, for, let's say, an extended system, uh, you might have to reevaluate whether these are good choices. And in general, it's a good idea to, uh, to basically play around with different values and try to find the set of hyperparameters that work best. Um, so here we'll, we'll use a cutoff radius of 3.7 angstrom. We have three species in our system, uh, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, we're going to use 12 radial basis uh, functions. Um, and the, the actual function we'll use uh, is the Chebyshev polynomials. And we're going to truncate the spherical harmonics at an L value of 3. And that, that defines our descriptor. So we can go ahead and run this block. And that's going to define uh, an object here, B2 which allows us to calculate these descriptors. Uh, if we basically feed in a, a structure of atoms, uh, we, we can calculate the, this vector of uh, invariant quantities. OK, so that, that defines the descriptor. And the, the next step we need to take in order to sort of make our Gaussian process well-defined is to choose a kernel function. And so in this example, we're going to use a kernel that looks like this. Uh, so it's, it's basically a normalized dot product kernel raised to an integer power. Uh, again, if you're familiar with the, the SOAP kernel, it's basically the same idea here. So what we want to do is compare two of these uh, descriptor vectors, D1 and D2. And so the way we do it with, with this dot product kernel is we dot the descriptors into each other. Uh, we normalize them. So we're going to divide by the norm. And so basically, uh, D1 vector divided by D1 here is going, to, um, is going to be a normalized vector. And so when we dot the normalized vectors into each other, we'll get a value that lies between 0 and 1. Uh, we then raise that to a power of 2, and then multiply by, uh, by the signal variance out front here, uh, sigma. Uh, and that, that gives us our kernel. Um, and the only choices we have to make when defining this uh, is a value for this sigma. Okay, so this, this is a hyperparameter of, of the model. And in general, you can optimize it by you know, maximizing the, the likelihood of the GP. Uh, and we also need to choose a power. Uh, so uh, 2 is often a good value to choose. Um, higher values basically lift you to, to like higher dimensional feature spaces. So in principle, they can give you a richer model. Uh, but in practice, a value of 2 uh, works quite well uh, for this data set. Okay, so this block of code is going to define our kernel object. And then finally, we need to define uh, a sparse GP object. And to do this, we're going to feed in the kernels that we just defined and also a set of noise values. 
And so, you know, when you're building a force field, there are basically three quantities of interest that you could, uh, in principle, train on. Uh, so there's the potential energy uh, of a set of atoms. And so associated with that uh, type of label, we have an energy noise. And it's, uh, it's often reasonable to choose a value of uh, around 5 MeV per atom. Um, and because this data set is in kcal per mole, uh, we're, we're just going to convert that to kcal per mole. Uh, the other type of label is forces. So on each atom, uh, we have a, a vector uh, pointing in some direction. Um, and for force labels, we can also have an associated force noise. Uh, and in this example, we're going to set that to 5 MeV per angstrom. Uh, and finally, it's also possible to train on stress. Uh, so basically, if, if you take your structure of atoms and you uh, deform the, the cell in some way, so maybe you expand it or compress it, uh, the stress is telling you how does the energy change as a function of that, uh, of that deformation. Um, and the stress is, is a quantity that you can get from electronic structure calculations, uh, and so you can also train on it. Um, and so in general, it's, it's a good idea to set this to around 0.1 gigapascal. Uh, but in this example, we're actually just going to train on forces. So it's, it's really just this force noise that, that's going to play a role uh, in the model. OK, so that block of code will define our GP. And finally, we're ready to actually go through the training set and calculate these descriptors. So this next block of code is, is going to loop over each of the validation structures and training structures. We're going to grab the positions. And, um, and the forces, and then we create a structure object. So this, this just takes in the, the periodic cell, the species of the atoms, the positions of the atoms, uh, the cutoff radius for building our neighbor lists, and the descriptor uh, objects that we just defined. And uh, when we build one of these objects, uh, the descriptor calculator that we defined is going to compute uh, all, all of the descriptors and their gradients and this is what is going to be used to, to build the model. Okay, so if we run this, uh, we're going to loop over the validation points. And you can see we've calculated all the, all of the descriptors. Now we're looping over training points. Okay, and so all of our descriptors are calculated. And now we're ready to, to sort of train one of these sparse Gaussian process models. Uh, and so um, if you just run this block right away, it's going to take probably uh, a minute or two to, to get through the training process. And you can see we've sort of started to started to train. I'll just walk through um, what we're doing in each of these lines of code while, while it's running. So the idea here is we're going to look at different batches um, of, of training structures. So after adding uh, 10 training structures to the training set, we're going to evaluate the performance on the validation set. And uh, this allows us to calculate the validation or, or the learning curve of the model. So how well are we doing basically as a function of the training set size? And so uh, what we do is we loop over uh, each of the training structures. Um, and we add the training structure to the training set. And we also select which uh, environments to include in the sparse set. So for this sort of simple example, um, we're not going to actively select the sparse points. I'm just going to take every chemical environment and put it in the sparse set. This is a kind of ac accuracy maximizing uh, way to go, but it can also introduce redundancy and kind of slow down the model. Uh, and so later in the tutorial, we'll see how you can choose these sparse environments in an online fashion. Uh, so basically, as you're doing an MD simulation, you can, you can evaluate uncertainties on each of the local environments in your structure and then make a choice about which ones to include uh, in the sparse set and, and which to exclude because you've already sort of seen it before. Um, and once we've looked at a batch of 10, we're going to check uh, the mean absolute error on the validation set. And so we loop over each validation structure. Uh, we make a prediction with the sparse GP. And then we compare it to the ground truth. Uh, so basically the forces that are coming from, uh, from the MD17 data set. And then what we report here uh, is just the mean absolute error in, in kcal per mole per angstrom on this validation set. And so you can see as we add more and more data, um, the trend you expect, of course, is that the, the error is going to go down. And usually what you're interested in is, you know, how, how quickly uh, are you going down relative to other models? So in this final uh, uh, code block here, if you run it, you should see a plot uh, uh, pop up. So here we're looking at the MAEs that we just computed as a function of the, the number of training structures. And so 
uh, because you know we, we wanted to run this in a reasonable amount of time, we only went up to 100 training structures. Uh, but I've also plotted here um, the performance of two, two other models that, that have sort of uh, studied this, this particular system. So there's the GDML model and uh, the more recent SGDML model. These are both uh, kernel-based approaches. Uh, and you can see, you know, if, if we were to go to 1,000, uh, we would sort of be hitting uh, cl close to state-of-the-art accuracy. So th this is sort of a testament to the power of the descriptor that we're using. Um, and, and in general, when you're building one of these models, it's a very good idea to compute, uh, compute the learning curve um, for different sets of hyperparameters just to see how well you're doing uh, and, and to check that everything is working properly. So this is basically the workflow for training on a static data set. And there are a few topics that I, I didn't go in, uh, over in detail, like optimizing hyperparameters. Um, uh, but th these are essentially the, the basic steps that you would go through if you want to train a force field kind of offline. Uh, and so the next section will be on training a force field on the fly. So while you're doing molecular dynamics, you're trying to refine the force field. Uh, so before we dive into that, I will just quickly uh, check the Slack uh, and see if there are any questions at this point. Okay, so Carlos asks, uh, would this method fail if there's a discontinuity on the energy? Um, so in practice, if we're dealing with, for example, density functional theory, uh, there won't be a discontinuity on the energy. It's actually the underlying function that we're trying to learn uh, is going to be smooth as a function of the, the coordinates of the ions. Um, but if you had some theoretical um, discontinuous model that you were trying to learn, in principle, it, it could still work. Um, so for example, you could train just on energies and those energies, you know, in principle could be discontinuous. The GP is going to be a continuous uh, function. Um, so you're, you're going to approximate a discontinuous function with a continuous one. Um, but, uh, but, you know, in principle, it, it's still possible. Um, uh, Matteo asks, what about permutation symmetry? Yeah, so the descriptor that, uh, that I, I defined uh, is invariant to permutational, uh, um, permutations of similar atoms. So if I were to swap, for example, two carbon atoms in the aspirin molecule, uh, then the descriptor will, will be the same. Um, and... Yeah, that looks like uh, all of the questions for now. Okay, uh, could you say what MAE is measuring? Um, so MAE is, uh, is, it stands for mean absolute error. Uh, and so what we're doing, uh, just going back to our calculation here. So when we compute the MAE, we're taking the validation forces and we're subtracting our predicted forces with the GP. So that gives us the, the difference between the true forces and the predicted forces. We take the absolute value uh, of that difference, and then we take the mean. And so that, that's the mean absolute error. And it's just quantifying how, how well we're doing, basically. Uh, so what's the, what's the error level on the, on the validation set? And as you add more and more training data, the model gets better and better. And so in general, uh, you, you should see a picture like this, um, where if you plot it on a log-log uh, scale, the MAE should sort of drop in a, in a linear way. Um, and so Chris, Christian asks, so you can update the interactions between the atoms during a simulation. Uh, what is the benefit? Why wouldn't the interactions be defined before the simulation? What do you gain from this approach? Right, so that's a good question. And we're, we're about to see an example of that in the next section of the tutorial. But the idea is, uh, in general, it can be quite a challenging task to manually construct a training set for a given material. Um, so for example, if you wanted to construct a training set for a, a tricky reactive system, you don't necessarily know a priori what all of the relevant configurations are that you're going to encounter. And so uh, this sort of on-the-fly learning approach uh, is, is a type of solution to this problem, where you, you sort of figure out what configurations are relevant while the simulation is running. Um, and the other nice thing about it is that it's, it's an automated approach. So uh, you allow the, the Gaussian process to kind of take over the, the the training process. And this allows you to do sort of a lot of these simulations in parallel without needing to sort of manually intervene and make choices. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the rationale behind this uh, on the fly idea. Uh, Juan asks, have these methods gone far in tackling the problem of protein folding? Uh, that's a really good question. 
Um, uh, so the answer is uh, not really. So a lot of these machine learning uh, methods have been applied to uh, uh, somewhat simple bulk materials. In the last few years, they've, they've started to be applied to uh, more like multi-element systems that are a bit more challenging. Um, but, um, and of course, there are a lot of models on kind of small organic molecules. Um, but tackling really big proteins, um, really uh, uh, state-of-the-art there is, is still using classical force fields. So th this is sort of at the frontier uh, of these machine learning methods. And I think uh, in the coming years, I I'm sure there will be a lot of efforts to, to try to tackle proteins, but it is, it is a really big challenge, in part because you have so many atoms in the system and it's very tricky to figure out which conformations are relevant. Um, I, I'll quickly answer the remaining question. So Ryan asks, is there a period of time in the simulation that would essentially be discarded uh, while the interactions are being trained? Uh, not necessarily. So, so the, the point of the on-the-fly simulation is to sort of collect relevant configurations. But when you actually want to do a, a sort of real production molecular dynamic simulation, um, you, you would take your trained model and fix it and then do a, do a big simulation. Uh, and so in that setting, energy is conserved and the model isn't constantly changing. Um, and finally, uh, German asks, uh, can this method learn from non-periodic non-period DFT data? Um, so, for example, affordable hybrid functionals, meta-hybrid GGAs, et cetera. Um, the answer, uh, I believe, is yes. There, sh there shouldn't be any, um, any problem with that. So um, the example we just looked at uh, uh, is just a, a single molecule, so uh, it's it's not periodic. We just sort of put it in a large cell. Um, but in general, these models are are local in character, and so um, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be to, to be periodic. It should work fine for um, uh, even finite systems. Okay, so thank you all for the uh, great questions. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the next section, and then uh, I'll revisit the questions uh, again at a later point. But the goal of the second section is to sort of see this on-the-fly learning uh, idea in action. Um, and because, you know, DFT is, is expensive, we're not going to um, uh, use DFT in this, uh, in this tutorial. We're sort of going to use a stand-in potential. Uh, so we're going to have uh, an embedded atom model potential as our reference. Uh, and this will allow us to really quickly uh, evaluate forces. Um, but in, in real settings, of course, what you want to do is uh, make calls to DFT. So you'll have some, some DFT calculator like VASP uh, running in the background. And whenever the uncertainty on an atom uh, goes above your threshold, you make a call to, to DFT. So what we'll do is download um, this EAM potential from the NIST database. And we're going to use uh, a package called the Atomic Simulation Environment uh, to, to evaluate uh, energies and forces. And so these next blocks of code are just defining uh, a calculator inside of the, uh, the ASC package that's going to let us evaluate these EAM forces. And now we're going to sort of step by step go through uh, what's required in order to learn one of these Gaussian process models on the fly during an MD simulation. So the, uh, the first step uh, is to choose the initial structure. So uh, what we'll simulate is basically an aluminum slab with an add atom on top. And uh, if you run this, this block of code, you're going to see a, a very zoomed in version of the slab. But if you scroll down on your trackpad, uh, if, you, if you're using a Mac, it um, should be similar on a PC, uh, you should be able to see the slab that we've just defined. Uh, and if you rotate it around a little bit uh, and zoom out a little bit more, so th this is sort of the structure that we're going to, uh, going to be looking at. So we want to simulate the dynamics of each of these atoms. And you can see we have six layers in our slab. And this add atom on top uh, is going to sort of diffuse around on the surface. And the thing to notice about this system uh, is that uh, we have a lot of examples of uh, bulk environments. And so uh, the model is going to very quickly learn how to model the bulk. Uh, but we only have one example of an add atom. Uh, and so this is going to be the trickiest part of the system uh, uh, to learn. Um, and we're going to see later that the uncertainty of the model is going to be highest for this, for this add atom. Uh, and we will get a nice visual of that later in the tutorial. Um, so that, that, that's the first step, is just defining your initial structure. So this is going to be the first frame in our molecular dynamics simulation. Uh, and then the next step is to choose some settings for your MD run. So we're going to do a, a very simple uh, simulation. Basically, we're going to set the temperature, the initial temperature, to 200 Kelvin. 
uh, and we're going to simulate in the NVE ensemble, uh, so constant energy. Uh, in, in you know, practice, it's often convenient to sort of add a thermostat to control temperature or to add a barostat to control pressure. Uh, and you can do all of that uh, within the atomic simulation environment. Um, but, but for this demonstration, we'll just do very simple molecular dynamics. Uh, and so this defines our MD engine. And the next step, uh, we've sort of already gotten a, a flavor for this in the, in the first section of, uh, of the notebook. Uh, we want to choose our model settings. Uh, so we're going to define our sparse Gaussian process. And again, what that involves is uh, basically choosing our cutoff, uh, parameters of our kernel, like the signal variance and the, the power of the kernel, uh, the cutoff function and radial basis set, uh, the number of radial basis functions, number of spherical harmonics. Um, we're also going to set our noise values, um, so the energy, force, and stress noises. And the new thing in this code block uh, that we need to define is the type of uncertainty that we're going to compute. Uh, so in this demonstration, we're going to calculate uncertainties on local energies. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, every uh, atom in the system is getting assigned a local energy, which makes a contribution to the total potential energy. And for each of those local energy uh, evaluations, there's an associated uncertainty. Uh, and so we're going to compute this uncertainty, and we're going to use it to guide um, our, our judgment calls about when to uh, make a call to our, our reference model, uh, which in this case is EAM. Uh, and then we, we wrap um, our model uh, in, in a form that's compatible with, with the flare code, which we're using to sort of uh, generate our on-the-fly dynamics. So this block will set up our model. And finally, in step four, we, we choose settings for the on-the-fly run, and then we, we run the dynamics. And so if you're running this uh, notebook on your own browser, I'll, I'll just have you uh, start the simulation now. And you can see at the end, uh, at the end of this block, we're going to start generating uh, the dynamics. And so this will run for a couple of minutes. Uh, and while it's running, I'll just walk you through uh, the settings that you need to choose here. So uh, basically, the, the most important choices that you need to make um, are, are the following. So you need to choose an uncertainty tolerance. In other words, uh, at what point uh, are, are you going to decide that uh, the uncertainties uh, on local energies are, are too high? And this is determined by a threshold value that you can define. And so here, because our uncertainties are normalized to lie within 0 and 1, uh, a reasonable value is 1%, and that's what we're going to choose. Uh, but in practice, it's often a good idea to sort of explore different values. So if you choose a bigger threshold, that's going to trigger fewer calls to DFT during your simulation. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's potentially going to reduce the accuracy of your model uh, since you're, you're sort of getting less data uh, uh, while you're generating the dynamics. And so there is definitely a, a balance to strike. Uh, and in different settings, uh, different values might be appropriate. Um, and the other important thing to choose is uh, what I'm calling the update style. So uh, in other words, how do we select uh, sparse environments to include uh, in the sparse set of the GP? Uh, and so earlier in our first example, we just took uh, every environment in the structure and put that in the sparse set. Uh, but you can, of course, uh, be a little bit smarter about how you make this choice. And so here what we're going to do is evaluate uh, uncertainties on each of the environments, and then only include uh, those environments that have uncertainty above the chosen threshold value. Uh, and we're choosing that threshold value here to be half of our, uh, uh, of our tolerance factor. So uh, basically half of a percent. Uh, and so, in other words, when DFT gets called, it's only the environments with uncertainty above half of a percent that get added to the sparse set. Um, and there are a, a few other choices that we're, that we're making here. So, um, in particular, we're deciding how many times we want to perform hyperparameter optimization. Um, so this is determined by the freeze hypes uh, uh, parameter here. Um, we're also defining uh, the minimum number of steps that we're going to take with the Gaussian process in between DFT calls. And this helps kind of separate out the number of calls that get made to DFT in, in practice. Um, uh, finally, we're choosing our update style, uh, which I just described. And um, there are a couple of parameters to choose about how long you want the simulation to go for. So we're choosing a time step of one femtosecond, and we're just going to do 500 steps. So it's quite a short run. In, in practice, usually you want to simulate for 
uh, you know, at least a few thousand, uh, maybe tens of thousands. Um, uh, but here, you know, 500 is, is doable within the, the CoLab environment. Um, and so uh, hopefully this has run by now. So if you see the play button, basically the simulation has finished. And um, we can now do a little bit of analysis. So running this block is going to parse the output file. And if you, if you would like, um, you can see the output file by clicking on this folder here. And you should see a file that says al.out, uh, standing for aluminum.out. Um, just to give you a sense for what the output file looks like, um, if you double click on it, that should download the output file. If you have troubles downloading it, don't worry. I'm just going to pull it up on my screen, and, and you can uh, you can just look at my screen. Um, basically, it should. Um, let me just make sure that my screen is sharing uh, on the right. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, if you did download the output file, uh, your text editor should be able to uh, to open it, and you'll see something that looks like this. So, uh, basically, we're we're reporting information about the on the fly simulation that we just did. So for example, you can see uh, you know, the, the previous positions. At the top of the file, we have some information about the initial hyperparameters, uh, some information about the uncertainty tolerance. And then when we actually start the simulation, you can see initially we have our call to DFT. And so again, this is not DFT. This is just our, an EAM potential. But in real simulations, uh, you would be making a call to DFT. And you can see the DFT forces um, are reported in the second column here. Uh, so this is kind of our, our ground truth, and this is the information that we use to train uh, the initial model. And uh, in the third column here, labeled uh, standard deviation, uh, these are our uncertainties. And so, of course, this is um, a call to the reference, uh, and so we're, we're, you know, we have null uncertainties initially. Uh, and in the final column, we have the velocities of each atom. And you can see after the initial call to DFT, uh, we add... Uh, all of the atoms to the to the sparse set uh, initially. We re-optimize the hyperparameters, so you can see the optimized values listed here, and also the, the log marginal likelihood of the sparse GP and its gradient. And then the model kind of takes over. So in frame number one here, we've taken our first step with the Gaussian process force field. And the predictions on forces that are being made are predictions made by the GP. And you can see, interestingly, the, the uncertainties here, and notice uh, it's only one column that's going to have non-zero values because we're predicting uncertainties in uh, local energies. Uh, if we were computing uncertainties on forces, for example, we would have uh, three different columns corresponding to the X, Y, and Z components. Uh, but notice that the uncertainties are very low uh, in general. In fact, some of them are, are zero to the first four decimal places. Uh, and the highest uncertainty is on the, the final atom here. This is the, the add atom that sort of looks different from all of the others. And as we move forward and take a few steps with the GP, you can see this uncertainty starts to kind of creep up. Uh, so we, we go to 0 0.0016, 0 0.0022. And if we move forward um, a few steps, you can see it continues to go up. And remember, the, the tolerance value we chose was 0 0.01. And so once this uncertainty goes above 0.01, uh, we make you know, a, a call to DFT. So if I scroll down enough, uh, we're going to see this. So in frame 18 here, you can see that the uncertainty on the add atom finally goes above 0.01. And that triggers a call to DFT, or for us, our, our EAM calculator. And so we, we calculate ground truth forces at this point, And then we re retrain the model. So we re-optimize the hyperparameters, and then we continue with the simulation, uh, updating it as needed whenever the uncertainty goes above uh, the threshold. So that's, that's sort of what, uh, uh, what the output file looks like. And um, what we're going to do is just parse the output file so that we have you know, all of the information about the run. Um, and here, uh, if we parse it first, we can plot temperature as a function of time. This is in the top plot here. Uh, and in the bottom plot, we have the potential energy as a function of time. And the x's correspond to all of the DFT or EAM calls that get made during the simulation. So you can get a sense for the accuracy of the model in the second plot. So we're, we're comparing uh, the, the ground truth DFT energy to the, uh, to, to the energy that's predicted by the Gaussian process. And you can see 
for almost all of these points, we're kind of right on the money. So we're accurately reconstructing the underlying potential. Um, this next block uh, will create an XYZ file, which you can visualize in, uh, for example, Ovito, if you have it. Um, but if not, uh, don't worry about it. This, um, uh, this movie here is sort of showing you uh, what you would see if you were to visualize this in Ovito. And so what I've, I've done here is I've colored each atom uh, by its uncertainty. And so when the atom turns red, that means that we have uh, sort of reached the, the uncertainty tolerance that we defined, our value of 0 0.01, uh, and a, a call to the EAM calculator is made. And you can see it's, it's the add atom that's sort of triggering all of the calls, which from a, a physical point of view makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is the environment that least resembles all the others. Uh, but you can see as well, there's some uncertainty on the atoms immediately around this add atom. You can see they, they sort of turn white. Uh, and so th this is kind of how the, how the Gaussian process is, is working. So it's computing these uncertainties, and whenever they're too high, you can see whenever this atom turns red, we're retraining the model, and so the uncertainty immediately drops back down to zero. Uh, and you can see uh, it, it turns blue uh, immediately after it goes red. Um, and that, that's basically how an on-the-fly simulation uh, uh, works in practice, uh, at least for a fairly simple uh, example. And so that, that uh, brings us uh, to the end of, uh, of this tutorial notebook. Um, I'll just mention that there, there are going to be a few different talks um, on different applications of, of this flare code uh, during the March meeting. And uh, so I just wanted to point you to uh, some of the different talks. Um, so Blake uh, on Tuesday morning will uh, give a talk on applying this to coarse grain force fields. Uh, Boris uh, on Tuesday will give an invited talk, uh, uh, giving sort of an overview of this active learning method. Um, you, Tuesday afternoon, will talk about uh, uh, sort of accelerating the calculation of the GP uncertainties and also discuss an application to two-dimensional materials. Um, I, I will give a talk on Wednesday afternoon on uh, trying to accelerate the, these many body models and get around this expensive loop over the, the training points that's required in a Gaussian process model. Uh, Stephen will talk about extensions to transition metals. Um, uh, Anders will talk about thermal conductivity applications. And David, finally on Friday, will discuss uh, some of our work on applying this to bimetallic catalysts. Um, and so that, that brings me to the end. Um, and so I am very happy to take a look at the Slack and see uh, if there are any questions at this point. Uh, but right. thank you, everyone, for your attention. Which, um, I see some have been answered. Um, but, uh, so are there any potential memory issues due to large training data during active learning? Uh, yeah, so it depends on the system. Uh, and the more complex your system is, the more training data you're going to need. So if you're just training like a, a bulk uh, material, you really don't need that, that much training data. And, and even a few DFT calls is pretty much sufficient. Um, but as soon as you start going into, for example, reactive simulations, we have all kinds of diverse environments that can show up. You need a lot of, uh, of data, so hundreds of DFT calls. Um, and so memory issues can be a problem. Uh, so e even with the GP itself, so you need to store the covariance matrix, you need to store all of these descriptors. Uh, so uh, in practice, it is an issue, and uh, it is one that we've encountered. Um, uh, so, and, and there are solutions. So you, you can uh, distribute memory in, in smart ways. That's one of the things we're actually working on. Uh, but yeah, this, this is definitely an issue. Uh, Carlos asks, has this method been applied for parameterizing force field from experimental observations or other top-down approaches? Yeah, there has been some work in that direction. Um, th this obviously was, was focused primarily on uh, MD simulations, uh, but, but there uh, is work along those lines, and it, it looks like... Um, uh, Boris has answered this question as well. Uh, so Pierre Paul, so the DFT is only called on unsure forces, but not on hypothetical environments that could benefit to the GP. Yeah, so this is sort of the idea. We're only uh, making calls to DFT when, when we need it, basically. Um, so uh, this allows us to sort of perform very targeted simulations, for example, of, of a specific temperature or, or pressure. Um, and we don't really want to include unnecessary local environments. Um, and so one of the nice things about this automated approach is that we're, we're only including the environments that we need uh, as determined by the uncertainty of the GP. Um, 
uh, and we don't we don't include things that aren't relevant for the specific simulation of interest. Um, uh, German asks, uh, is it possible to save the force field generated with the OTF procedure to be used in further simulations to see the performance in bigger systems? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, actually, a couple of the talks uh, that I, I mentioned at the end of my presentation are going to uh, uh, mention this exact issue. Um, so you can save the GP, but you can also map it onto a much faster model. Um, basically, you can exploit a, a certain duality between kernel-based models and linear models to kind of transform it into a linear model, which is much faster. Uh, and th this allows you to really scale up the simulations to, to kind of produ production level uh, uh, MD. Uh, so it is definitely possible. And um, uh, come, come check out um, Yu's talk and, and also my own talk uh, to hear more about that. Um, Liliana asks, are the force fields general for all atoms of a certain type? Uh, what if you need a set of molecules to be unique? Uh, for example, if a set of molecules are undergoing a reaction. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so the way that we're uh, computing this uncertainty is based on local environments. So, uh, and the descriptor is distinguishing between different species. Uh, so what that means is, if, if a particular atom of some species in the simulation uh, is undergoing a reactive event that, uh, that the model has never seen before, the descriptor is going to be very different from all of the training uh, descriptors. And so the uncertainty will be high, and that's going to trigger a, a DFT call. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question, but, uh, but the idea is that, yes, it, it does work well for multi-element systems and, and for reactive systems. Um, so I, I think that uh, uh, brings us to the end of the questions. So again, uh, thank you very much for uh, all of the great questions. And uh, I'll be happy to chat more uh, in, the, in the networking session afterwards.